On behalf of the General Assembly Council, I want to be sure you understand our promise. And that is that the document that you prepare, what it is that bubbles up in our midst through a gift of the Spirit, will indeed be taken by the Council and used at every turn in the road, along with other insights that are coming in across the Church, so that we are shaping an agenda and a mission and a life together that indeed is one which represents the fullness of the Gospel and the wholeness of the Church. With these words as their promise and guide, the 468 Convocation participants began their task, planning for the future of the Presbyterian Church USA. This video shows the open space technology they used for creating their agenda, convening discussion groups, and producing a book. Participants gathered at the Weston O'Hare, not quite sure what they were about to undertake, but very sure it would be a weekend unlike many others. Everyone knew that in some small way, the denomination was counting on them to make a difference, to discern a path, to have a special insight about our church's future. Convocation began with worship. Preacher Bill Philippi selected a Pentecost theme, challenging the Convocation's participants to be nimble. He said this is not a new challenge. Moses and Miriam faced a similar situation after crossing the Red Sea. The intention was to march directly to Canaan under the protection and guidance of Yahweh and occupy the new land. Twelve spies were sent out to reconnoiter and they came back. And ten said, no, it's a beautiful land, but it's a land of giants and we can't do that. But Joshua and Caleb said we should. We're on a roll. Let's go. But as so many times in our history, the majority conservative report won the minds of the people and the thumb suckers got their way. And the complaint of the people was heard again and again and again. They really didn't want the spirit. And therefore, they couldn't have the power. Philippi closed, saying this is a Kairos moment for our denomination. I challenge you in the name of the prophets, in the name of Jesus our Christ, I challenge you in the name of John Calvin to rise up and discover that new day. Pray for this spirit to be among you now. Thursday evening ended in small groups convened to share faith stories. Participants were asked to set aside time before the convocation to pray, preparing themselves to be sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They were asked to bring their Bible with them to Chicago. We want to continually be engaged by the scriptures. We want to continue to engage the scriptures. We want to pray together and also have some time to be quiet and to let the spirit speak to us and to be intentional about that. Base groups of five to eight people formed randomly, scheduled their own daily meetings and became the center for Bible study and prayer. Open space technology provided the framework for the remainder of the convocation. Friday morning, consultant Harrison Owen asked participants to center themselves. Just take a long look at all the resources and richness right here. And then while you're doing that, you might want to think about what would all of this look like if it all worked? Not open space. I mean us, this world, this church. What would it really be like if it all worked? Because today we put all of you together with that question. And there's nobody but you to supply the answer. Owen set the scene, saying our denomination and our world are caught between the old and the new, standing at the moment of creation. Most of the ways that we've learned to do things before have not, will not, and are not going to work. And yet there is within this room, this group, this universe, this people, the resources to create what is new and what is needed. You know, it's interesting. There isn't a single they in this room. 
You know, they do, they did this, they're responsible. It's all we's. It's all us. And then a remarkable thing happened. The agenda was created, groups were formed, and rooms were assigned in about one hour's time. Owen asked people with a passion for an issue to come forward, identify their issue, list it on newsprint, announce their issue, and post it. He told participants not to come forward unless they were willing to take responsibility for managing their issue. Taking responsibility meant convening meetings and writing a computer record of the group's discussion and recommendations. About 150 people came forward that first day, twice the number Owen expected. Quickly they turned the bare walls of the ballroom into a community bulletin board. The agenda for the convocation truly came to Chicago with the participants. All of the secrets as near as they were hiding in whatever closets, I think, are up on that wall. There's a wonderful thing that happens when all of a sudden what everybody knew but nobody dared say is out there. You don't have to pretend anymore. Participants joined groups which interested them. Discussions began. For the remainder of the day and all of the next, groups met. Some groups were large, others small. Conversations occurred in halls, bedrooms, breakout rooms, and at meals. Food was served buffet style, so group discussions could end at varying times. Dozens of meetings overlapped. Four principles and one rule governed the meeting format. The four principles are, whoever comes to a meeting is the right people, whatever happens is the only thing that could have, whenever the meeting starts is the right time, and when it's over, it's over. The one law was the law of two feet. Owen asked participants to move, use their feet, and go somewhere else when they perceived their time was not being spent wisely. This meant some people chose to be bumblebees, going from group to group, cross-pollinating ideas. Other people never attended groups, but voiced their opinions in private conversations that eventually influenced group discussions. Friday afternoon, the participants met to compare notes. They had been talking, some of them almost nonstop, for seven hours. And I want to hear a word. So, exciting. Learning. Nothing new. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Open. Sherry. Frustration. We'll make it. Fun. Uh, frustration. <laughs> Incomplete. Uh, creativity. Hang on After this quick check, tomorrow. discussion resumed all over the hotel. It continued through dinner and well into the evening. As groups finished, their convener reported to the newsroom to enter group comments and recommendations into the computer file of the convocation. As reports were generated, they were posted on the wall outside the newsroom. Participants gathered in the hallway to read about the various group discussions. By Saturday morning, it became clear to several people that additional groups needed to be formed because some important issues had not been announced Friday. We have come here from all over the country to deal with a very serious problem, and I think we're piddling around, and I think the wrong question was asked yesterday. We were responding to the question of what do we feel passionately about, which means that what we did was we raised our own issues up the flag. We're not here for that. We're here because the church is hemorrhaging and because we need to stop the hemorrhage. And not only do we need to stop the hemorrhage, we need to ask how can we get well? I've enjoyed some of the discussions, but I don't think the book is going to be helpful unless we take responsibility, which you've encouraged us to do, and say what we believe as a group that was very carefully selected what we believe the priorities are before the church over the rest of this decade and into the next century. If you're interested in doing that, I would invite you to come to a new issue group. The ability to add meetings, adjusting the agenda without major dislocation, is what makes open space technology so successful for groups facing an unknown future. With those comments as a challenge, more issues were defined and a second long day of meetings began. Owen said he would have been very disappointed if there hadn't been new issues on Saturday. What open space does is a, it allows people, it encourages people, and I suppose at some level it coerces people uh, to think of the whole thing before they try and come to the answer. 
And so it's really an opening process. So at the very simple level, we know what we're talking about. The issue really here has nothing to do with issues of the church or polity or finance or anything like that. It is quite literally creating appropriate responses to a transforming world. By Saturday afternoon, the newsroom once again was the center of activity as dozens of reports were filed and posted. Officially, 143 issues were discussed, posted, printed, and included in the Convocation's book. Less than two days after it began, the Convocation had produced 349 pages of comments and recommendations for the General Assembly Council and the denomination to review. If you look at the participant list and who put it up, you have a built-in, if you want to call it that, organizational structure for, for growing the church. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that every issue, every group is the way to go at all. But it is part and parcel of the congregation that calls itself Presbyterian. Sunday morning, convocation participants celebrated their accomplishment and installed Jim Brown as GAC executive director. He and Council Chair Martha Martin received the first book. I give to you the results of this convocation. This represents the diversity of our church and its yearnings. This represents the spirit among us in these last two days. Our prayers go with you. Weave them into God's prayers. We look forward to hearing from you. The book, along with listening group reports from the summer of 1992, and the Independent Review Committee report acted on by the 204th General Assembly, form the nucleus of information the GAC will consult while deciding the future of our church. And I want to say thank you to every one of you for your commitment, for your active participation. I told you the book's longer than we expected. Everyone showed enthusiasm about what they had a passion for and were willing to accept responsibility for it. And that is something that we treasure and value. And I assure you that the General Assembly Council will treat the work that you have done with reverence, with appreciation, and with deep study. A moment of silence provided the transition from open space to the installation service. Participants gathered in circles the General Assembly Council in the center to pray and reflect. Participants departed quietly to pack, meet in prayer groups, and reconvene for the installation service. Preacher Jack Stotts said Presbyterians are a privileged and powerful people who often think they can control their destiny and avoid harm, but they can't. But God will not be restricted. God will not be controlled. Indeed, God's help may come through strange and unprecedented events and people. I mean, like a gathering of 500. It may come through a person who has been a pastor, not an ecclesiastical official, but whom we now call as executive director for a new day. It may come through discovering the grace of insufficient funds. It seemed fitting to install a new person to lead the General Assembly Council at this juncture in our history. Following the service, Brown said, there are some new winds blowing into the church, winds that blew 500 people into Chicago, winds that are pushing the denomination to find ways to do servant ministry in relationship to local churches. Brown said it's clear. The agenda for our church and our future is not business as usual. <laughs>